three, two. Welcome back to Thursday's Daily Huddle. Welcome back, family. I am your co-host. Co-host because you guys are my, my other co-hosts, right? Dr. Monica Orlando. And today we're talking about, are we spiritually designed to make assumptions? Little birdie told me I wouldn't have put those two things together. We're going to explore it today. And I have a quote for you. This quote comes from Joseph Murphy, renowned author, most like most notably of the book, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. And he says, all of us have our own inner fears, beliefs, opinions. These inner assumptions rule and govern our lives. A suggestion has no power in and of itself its power arises from the fact that you have already accepted it mentally. Welcome to the Daily Hub. Yay. I'm so happy to be here with you all. <laughs> Welcome to Spiritual Matters Thursday. I'm your host, Dr. Monica Ogando. I am so happy to be here with you today. I'm wearing my bright color, my red, because we're on fire today. We're about to get it in. So in order to get it in, we have to first get grounded. And I'm going to be asking you some grounding questions as we always do here in the Daily Huddle. So I'm going to ask my friend Stan, how are you and what are you grateful for? Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry about that. There we go. There we go. I, I'm committed to growing and helping the others to grow. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm going to hug my mom because I didn't get to hug her yesterday. Oh, I like the hug answer. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to ask somebody else about what they're grateful for. Sorrel. Sorrel, where, what time is it and what are you grateful for? Grateful. Sorrel is frozen. Sorrel is frozen. You want to take it, Giovanni? Uh, what time is it? Um... Let me see. The time is now. Mm -hmm. And the, um, what am I grateful for today? I am grateful for computers. I'm grateful for computers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and for fast internet access. I remember a comedian a long time ago saying something about how we got so entitled because we're like on a plane and we're like, ah, this email won't go. And he was like, give it a second. It's going to space. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so today we are going to be talking about assumptions. You guys have heard me playfully insert the pop culture reference of check yourself before you wreck yourself. Chickity check yourself before you wreck yourself. And that just speaks to uh, making assumptions. And it's not that assumptions themselves are in and of themselves wrong or inaccurate or ineffective, not inherently, but that's why we want to audit them so that we can make sure that we are operating out of assumptions that are effective and accurate and updated and relevant to our daily lives. Sometimes when I'm coaching someone, let me move this um, camera a little bit. Sometimes when I'm coaching someone, um, can you hear me better if I move this mic? Sound is good. Sound Sound is good. good. Doesn't matter whether I move it away or not. It oh. matters, but not very little. But very little. Okay, well, you know, speaking of useful, right? Checking assumptions. Um, so one of the things that I say to my coaching clients is that sometimes the map doesn't match the terrain. 
we're navigating a particular terrain. Let's say, for example, that you are physically, geographically in Atlanta, Georgia, right? Atlanta, Georgia has many peach trees, peach tree boulevard, peach tree lane, peach tree street, peach tree road, peach tree whatever. And if you think that you are in peach tree boulevard, when you're actually in peach tree road, you're gonna get lost. You have to check where you are, right? In the same way, most urban cities have some level of Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Most urban cities have a Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. But the Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard in Miami, Florida, isn't the same as in Broward County, just up the road in Fort Lauderdale. And it is certainly not the same one as in Atlanta or in New York or in Chicago, et cetera, et cetera. So just because it says the thing you're expecting it to say, doesn't mean that you are where you think you are. And so I wanted to take a moment, I wanted to take this episode with you and get into a discussion about, are we spiritually designed to make assumptions? And I'm gonna start first with the biological, the biological foundation of our spirituality. We always start at the lowest common denominator. And I want you to notice wherever you are, you may be in a car, you may be inside of a room or an office or your bedroom, you may be lying down. If you're CC, you're probably on a treadmill or an elliptical somewhere, right? And you're running on some assumptions. If you're in an office or indoors somewhere, you're running on the assumption that the ceiling is not gonna cave in on you. You would experience a certain level of fear and stress if you had that assumption. But you're not experiencing that level of fear and stress because you don't have that assumption. You assume you are physically safe. You assume that you know where your next meal is gonna come from. For some of us, some of us don't know that. Some of us aren't even eating, but that's another sermon for another Sunday. And so you're running on certain assumptions on a daily basis, some of them conscious and some of them unconscious. Some of them accurate and some of them inaccurate. And just because the assumption is accurate, here's a distinction that I wanna make, so I wanna make it really slowly. Just because an assumption is accurate doesn't mean it's not an assumption. There's a certain level of emotional distance that you have to get with your assumptions in order for you to not attach to them. And then when you, they prove inaccurate or outdated or false, then you get into a certain like stress mode. Oh, thank you, Stan. He complimented my haircut chat. What y'all think about my haircut? It's new, you know, it's very short. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, thank you. So, so when an assumption, when you're running on an assumption, it may be accurate. It may be true that the ceiling is not going to fall on you. That may be true. And it may be true all of the days of your life living in that house or, or working in that office, et cetera, et cetera, right? But to have the, the philosophical or psychological or emotional detachment of it may be true today it may not be true tomorrow <laughs> allows you a certain level of preparedness allows you a certain level of um, detachment and I'm going to assert it also empowers you with a certain level of imperturbability because then your world doesn't hinge upon certain things going this particular way. And if not, then you go crazy. There are certain things that when they don't go the way that we expect, we get upset, we get triggered, we get resentful. Maybe not of anybody in particular, maybe not of a large conglomerate out there or even a concept, capitalism, you know, or religion or culture or society or this generation or that generation. Sometimes we get upset at things we can't touch. But if you were operating from the, from the place of my assumptions are here to be audited and tested, then 
when things don't meet your expectations, your first reaction would be a pause and then curiosity instead of upset. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Put a one in the chat if, you, if you're resonating with what I'm saying. Because a lot of times that's the little, that's the little pause that we need in order to measure ourselves, in order to measure our response, in order to gather our thoughts, our feelings, our, like, what am I feeling? Why am I feeling this way? That nanosecond, that pause is what allows you to operate from your own place of discernment and wisdom instead of from just an automatic, almost biological reaction. And when someone, for example, hurls an insult at you or says something, a, a passive aggressive comment or a demeaning thing or asks you a particular question that you were not expecting, your sense of defensiveness or being offended at that isn't because they made an assumption about you. It's because you believe it. And they touched a sore spot. Just like our quote says from Joseph Murphy, a suggestion has no power in and of itself. Its power arises from the fact that you've already accepted it mentally. The reason why you get upset when I call you a blue frog is because you suspect you're a blue frog and you don't like it. <laughs> if, I, if you called me a blue frog, I'd be like, uh, okay, bless your heart. I mean, I could be there for you if you need to meet to be. <laughs> I don't find that particularly offensive because I don't have any charge on blue frogs. But some of us have charges on being a wife or not being a wife, being a husband or not being a husband, having children or not having children, our race, our gender, our generation, our socioeconomic status, where you are in your professional life, right? I'm using blue frog kind of um, tongue in cheek because it sounds so innocuous, but we have particular things that people touch on that because you already feel some type of way about it, because you already feel uh, self-conscious or defensive or awkward about it when they mention it it feels like an insult but they're really just touching on your own tender spot and so the pause of auditing your emotions or auditing your assumptions allows you to observe yourself in partial self-observation before you make it somebody else's problem that you have a tender spot that they just happen to articulate you see so are we spiritually designed to make assumptions? Yeah, biologically, it, sa it saves you a lot of RAM in your survival mechanism, in your reptilian brain, in your cognitive function, in your prefrontal uh, lobe to be able to make assumptions because there are certain things that you now don't have to think about. Even our physical bodies are designed that way. That's why we have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic nervous system. There are certain things you don't have to think about. When you go to sleep, you don't have to worry about whether your heart will keep beating. And if your heart doesn't keep beating by the time that you wake up, you won't have to worry about it anyway. <laughs> and so it's, yes, we're designed that way, absolutely. And because we are also, also consciousness evolving, we can watch ourselves, we can be consciously observing ourselves in the process of making assumptions and be able to say, this one works, this one doesn't work, this one serves me, this one doesn't serve me, and be able to drop them accordingly. So I'm gonna ask you a question as I invite you to engage in discussion with me. What are some of your assumptions that as you've gotten older have proven wrong or inaccurate? I'll go first. One of the assumptions that I had when I was a child was that I, that people owed me something. That when I asked for something or whatever, you needed to give it to me because Monica asked for that. And what Monica wants, Monica gets. Now that, that's still true, but not from a sense of entitlement, but more from a sense of being able to magnetize and being able to attract my, my blessings to me. But the sense of entitlement was an assumption because when I was little, my father and my mother were very much like, we love our children, we wanna give them what they want, et cetera. And some people would say they spoiled us. 
So then I grew older and I was like, why doesn't anybody treat me like mommy and daddy do? What? what? I'm supposed to get it on the first try, you know? And when we moved to this country, I realized, oh, they did that because they had resources back then that they don't have now. And I got disabused of the notion of being entitled <laughs> really quickly when I got to this country. I was like, oh, nobody owes you anything. And you don't owe anybody anything either. It goes both ways. So what are some of the assumptions that you've let go of? What are some of the assumptions that have proven inaccurate or wrong in your life? I'm so curious to find out. Who wants to go first? All right, Giovanni and then Cece and then Stan. Um, so Dr. Ogando always with some incredible inquiries. Um, It, as you're speaking, I can't help but to think that in my life, everything has been an assumption. Like, mm -hmm. Everything is an assumption. What What is not an assumption in my life? Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, everything is a subjective observation from my own worldview, right? Like, um, an assumption I had is that like what is it not an assumption that uh, my parents should love me like, no they shouldn't they don't have to or my parents owe me something because I came through them no they don't owe me anything uh, that has been an assumption um religion the whole the religion is an assumption spiritual you know I grew up with a particular belief it's all assumptions I mean what do I know my complete assumption the whole thing is an assumption and and as the, as the more I look into what you're pointing to, what comes to mind is what is not an assumption? Mm -hmm. What is not an assumption? And personally, I feel empowered by that. I yeah. don't necessarily as take on any worldview as the truth. Right. Religious or... Mm -hmm love or who i am or who i should be um that's that's what's there for me to start i can go on but perfect is, beautiful i i love that you point out um and thank you for presencing that because you're bringing in the definition of assumption and if you look up definition of assumption in the dictionary one of the first definitions is a thing that is accepted as true or as certain without proof Right. And so, and the sense, and then the second definition is the action of taking on power or responsibility. And I think the two are tied together because just like you said, if, if I can see something that is not necessarily true, if I don't have any proof of it, et cetera, then I can assume assumption, the responsibility or the power of creating something else. I think they go together. Cece, what were you going to say? Oh, exactly what you were talking about, because from my view, it's just an assumption in, in your right. And today I'm letting go of all my views of life. I am I'm taking responsibility for my future. I take responsibility for just today. And what I will be doing is not just looking at my view as the assumption, but looking and looking from a different direction because everything is assumption based on what the person sees. So what I'm going to do is look at what I can't see and mm -hmm. use that as a catalyst to move forward because I'm ready to move forward mm -hmm. and I don't want to use my assumptions I want to use something else bigger than just what I see <clears throat> from this direction so thanks so much for the uh, topic and and I like it and I pass all right thank you for that I like what you said about being open to that and letting go of some of the assumptions some of 
it, what I'm asking you to do, what I'm asking all of us to do is not so much to let go of your assumptions so much as it is to kind of like create some distance from them. You can still have them, <laughs> right? Um, and being distant enough to be able to not be attached to whether it's correct or not. So listen to the difference between these two statements. If, if I say to, let's say Giovanni and I are having lunch, we're waiting for Sorel, because typically it's a, it's a threefer. <laughs> and we're waiting for Sorel to arrive. And, and I say to Giovanni, um, let's say, I say to him, I'm so thankful that you weren't late this time. Let's say I say that, right? I'm expressing an experience of gratitude, but I'm assuming that he wasn't late. All I know, all I know is that when I got there, he was there. I don't know if he wasn't late. I was there late. I don't, you see what I'm saying? There's an assumption, right? Or if I say there's a difference between, for example, you are late and I'm mad about it versus I'm having the thought that you're late and that thought makes me mad. Do you see the difference? In one, I impute my assumption on somebody else. I don't even bother to check it. I'm simply having the thought and having the thought generates an emotional response for me, but has nothing to do with the person. And sharing it with the person may or may not be an act of connection. It may be an act of aggression, depending on how I say it. Stan, you were gonna say something? Well, perhaps this is not exactly what you, what you really mean, but uh, I've changed the assumption that I have to be alive tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, because um, I've been around long enough to see a lot of people that I thought were great. And the next day they were no longer in the land of living. So at least on this side of living. And so I, I don't like to uh, now just assume I, I, I can't walk around believing and think about all the time. You know, you might die. That's not the way to live. I don't think yeah. you can live. You can live well that way. But I think that it makes me take life a lot more seriously and. And, and really, really consider that I'm in a lot more uh, uh, often in a love mode yeah. for people than, than not. I like it. I like it. I started having the practice of saying to people that I'm in relationship with, friends, employees, clients, et cetera, I'm having the thought X, Y, Z. Because then it, then it almost becomes an intellectual exercise as opposed to somebody defending their position because I stated my position. And I have found that when I state it that way, I'm having the thought that, I'm having the thought that I'm tired or I'm having the thought that I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> or I'm having the thought that this conversation is not going to be very fruitful. It's just a thought. I could choose another thought. It's not true, like with a capital cosmic T. And then the person can be curious. Why are you having that thought? As opposed to, you know, yes, it will be fruitful conversation. Da, 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 da. And then defending the point instead of getting curious about my thought process. And I think that invites much more connection than stating a position. And I'm curious about how you guys have it. Do you, do you find that sometimes the way that you articulate something puts people on the defensive, assuming that you are, assuming that you are, when you stay at a position, you are in fact attacking? I see Laura nodding. What are you about to say? Yes. Oh, thank more. you for this conversation. I had the same conversation this morning. Yes, sometimes personally for me, mm -hmm. I might be communicating with someone, but before they listen to what I'm saying, they jump to a conclusion and they're ready to attack. Mm -hmm. So now I am so mindful of what I say to certain people I have to be so politically correct mm. to avoid the conflict mm -hmm. before they get, you know, the um, the misunderstanding or the judgment or whatever it is comes up to create some 
you know, confrontation. Mm -hmm. Now, is that creating emotional safety or is that just placating? Do you know, do you know, how does it feel to you when you do it? Um, placating. Mm. How would it feel if it was not placating, if it was creating emotional safety? It would feel um, secure, free to express. Yeah. And maybe like you didn't have to diminish anything about yourself in order to be able to have to give space to the other. Yeah, I do that. I do do. So I that's why I'm being mindful now. It's a struggle for me to keep diminishing myself to please others in a conversation. Because sometimes I do feel like I have issues communicating. So now I'm practicing to be mindful and to be really, to ask first, especially mm -hmm. before I communicate certain things, to ask if it's okay yeah. for the person to listen, you know, or to be willing to talk about certain issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. This is one of the reasons why I came up with the Grace Talk framework. I've, I've mentioned it here before. Could you yeah. repeat that? The Grace Talk Framework Grace okay. mm -hmm. is an acronym, mm -hmm. and the G in the Grace Talk stands for airing out the grievance. Mm -hmm. And there's a way to do that. You create emotional safety. You ask for permission in order to be able to do that. One of the most sweet examples that I have of this is with Sorel. Um, we were at a conference last year, 2021, I think. Or was it 2022? I don't remember. But um, no, 2022, yes. And um, we broke for lunch. There was something happening with the audio visual team that I was not pleased with and it was getting on my nerves, but I didn't want to take it out on the audio visual team. So when we broke for lunch, Sorel and I left and I said, I have a grievance. Do you have space to be able to hear it? It has to do with X, Y, Z. And the reason why I said it has to do with X, Y, Z is because sometimes it's hard to hear a grievance that's about you <laughs> when it's directed mm -hmm to you, <laughs> right? And so to be able to say it's about the audiovisual team gave Sorel the space to be like, oh, okay. She's not gonna, she's not about to go in on me, <laughs> right? So that, that layer creates a certain level of emotional safety. But then the other layer is about asking for permission. And it's like, cause he could have said no. And then we would have just been like, okay. I mean, I, I can talk about this with somebody else. But the assumption that the Grace Talk framework makes is that you are soothable, that you are seeking to be soothed. If you're not soothable now, if you're not soothed now, that you are soothable, that you're seeking to be soothed. Because if you just want to run it, if you just want to about your grievance, <laughs> that's not soothable. And you know, people got their limits on those. <laughs> and so I want to, I want to challenge all of us here. Um, you know, I like giving. I'm a teacher at art, you know, I like giving homework. I want to challenge you in your next journal session, in your next private time, et cetera, et cetera. Spend some time with yourself, asking yourself, what are the assumptions out of which I've lived my life or out of which I've operated in this relationship or out of which I've treated my personal habits? Take it, take, it could be as big as you want, the life, or it could be a very narrow thing, like this particular relationship or this particular season in your life or whatever it is. What are the assumptions out of which I've lived here that have generated these results? Whatever the results are, right? So six months ago, for example, I could have said, one of the assumptions that I'm living out of in regards to my personal fitness is that I don't have time to work out. That meal prepping is too time consuming and I don't have time. Therefore, I'm not available for the personal fitness that I want. And I had to check that assumption and operate out of a different one <laughs> in order to get the results that I'm getting now. Ciao, listen. Okay, this is, it's, good. it's ready. It's, this is all ready right now. It's different <laughs> than it was six months ago because I started making different assumptions. And so I want you to check in with yourself. What are the assumptions that I'm out of which I'm living this relationship or this fitness or this money relationship or whatever? such that these are my results. And then check in with yourself. 
Is it accurate? Is it relevant? Is it useful? Is it effective? Do you like your results? If you don't like your results, are you open to making different assumptions? Because you could assume that you have the power to change it. So I wanna thank you so much for being with us today. I appreciate the dialogue. I appreciate your contribution. I want you to know that we have officially inserted an eighth <laughs> principle of maximal living here at the Daily Huddle. I'm going to tell you the, 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 la the seven, the first seven that we've had for, for a year and a half or whatever it's been, two years. And then I want you to tell me what the eighth one is. So the first one, love generously, laugh ostentatiously. I always add like the guffaw. I want you to like cackle when you laugh, like have a good belly laugh, right? Move your body, shake your tail feather, dance, exercise, do a couple push-ups, whatever you can to move your body and get it going. Sleep at least seven hours. Give of yourself, give your time, give your attention, give your good graces, eat more plant-based food and stress less. And what, pray tell, is the eighth one? Somebody tell me. What is the eighth principle of maximal living here at the Daily Huddle? Check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> you gotta you gotta do the little wicked wicked the little you know rap mix. <laughs> Always audit your assumptions. Thank you so much for being with us today. I appreciate you. See you next time. Thank you, Doc. Peace and blessings, all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye now.